Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, good, off good morning for those uh, um, in the UK and good afternoon for people in more Central Europe. Uh, welcome at this webinar on inclusive research and innovation ecosystems in Europe. What works and how do we convince stakeholders? Uh, I'm very welcome to, to um, I'm very happy to welcome you here to this event, which promotes the work of the Calippa project, which is an EU project. And Calippa's vision is to enhance the gender balance in STEM related fields and promote greater engagement of female researchers, especially with, within research and innovation. Uh, Calippa's unique contribution is in stimulating discussion and dialogue, as well as collaboration between the different stakeholders in research and innovation. And these st stakeholders include the research sector, government, and other public bodies like industry, uh, business, and civil society. And together, we aim to work together to tackle gender inequalities within, the, um, within this ecosystem. This event is jointly organized by the Academia Europea Cardiff Hub, as you can see on the slide, and the Young Academy of Europe, who both collaborate within this EU Calippa project. Uh, and I'm very happy to welcome the panelists here. You see their names on the slides. Uh, I will ask in a, in a minute, I will ask each of the panelists to give a short opening statement. Uh, after that, we will go into the Q&A and you are asked to put your questions in the Q&A in the Zoom. So if you put your questions in the Q&A tab, we can keep track of your questions and we can make sure that your questions are being asked to our panelists. Um, the first panelist is uh, Marcella Linkova, the head of the Center for Gender and Science at the Institute of Sociology of the Czech Academy of Science. Our second panelist is Maria Sangiliona, Research Director and Program Manager of the Smart Venice and part of the Calippa Project, the Center Scientific Gender Equality Plans Manager. Uh, then we have Professor Anna-Marie Nakic. Assistant Professor uh, and part of the Calippa project as a principal investigator. And finally, Linda Gustafsson, Gender Equality Officer. So I will stop sharing my screen and then I would like to ask Marcela to open the floor. Okay. Good morning, everyone. It's really a huge pleasure to be here uh, with you today. Uh, and being able to contribute to this discussion. Um, maybe as a way of starting, I will first of all congratulate Caliper for all the work uh, that you have been doing, the deliverable reports, uh, the policy briefs that I have seen on, on your website. And also say that um, apart from being the head of the Center for Gender and Science in the Czech Republic, uh, I also was the chair of the Standing Working Group on Gender in Research and Innovation between 2017 and 2021. And uh, currently, I'm the coordinator of Gender Action Plus project, which brings together uh, national authorities, ministries in EU member states, as well as research funding organizations. And so I think that this is very relevant to the approach that, that you have in Caliper, really uh, involving a broad range of stakeholders. Um, I have said on multiple occasions throughout this year that we are really in a good spot for gender equality in research and innovation, although maybe not so much in all the countries uh, in Europe, but, but really at the policy level uh, where we are is really good. We have a robust policy framework with the Lublania Declaration. Uh, the uh, support of member states uh, continues to be strong. Member states agreed that uh, there should be um, a subgroup under the ERA Forum, which is the new governance structure uh, now, and the Commission has committed to, to create this subgroup, so I anticipate that this will be happening very soon. Gender equality, inclusive gender equality, continues to be uh, the uh, priority for the European research area. And uh, I'm really proud that the Czech presidency of the Council is now finishing uh, its term uh, with a call uh, to action to end gender-based violence in academia as an outcome of a presidency conference that uh, was organized at the end of November. And so I hope that we will uh, generate a lot of support uh, for this call for action, uh, which is at available online of the conference, uh, so that we have a strong basis uh, for taking uh, activities uh, to combat gender-based violence 
uh, in academia and research strongly uh, next year. Um, all of what I'm discussing points to really the huge importance of having uh, multiple stakeholders involved in the in the process, and this is what our discussion is about uh, today as well. I think that you have probably experienced the negative impacts of COVID-19 at the institutional levels uh, for the exchanges and driving uh, the change process forward. And I think that we have seen that across board in the EU funded sister projects and are slowly or have slowly recovered uh, from this uh, in, in this year. Um, I wanted to share uh, some experience from one of the projects um, that I think is really telling in a way, because we very often focus on, at the institutional level, on involving the top management, building the support. I mean, it's one of the building blocks of the EU eligibility criteria. We have the core teams of the transformation agents working with the top management and sometimes it's really difficult to reach out wider into the institution and the awareness among researchers, academics, uh, administrators, uh, perhaps students when that's relevant, remains really, uh, really at a lower level. And maybe we tend to underestimate it together, maybe with building uh, alliances with men. And um, at one of the uh, projects where I'm involved, uh, we conducted on-site visits. And uh, this is happening now at, at the end of the project. And we had a focus group with uh, men middle managers. Uh, it was a group so composed solely of men. And I have to say that this was one of the most rewarding experiences that I have had promoting uh, gender equality. And of course there was you know, some resistance at the beginning of this, but, but really what we see is there is interest. Some men uh, are extremely active. And uh, I think that we really need to pay a lot of attention to building these alliances uh, in the change processes, change projects uh, from the start, because I don't see that happen very often um, across board in the EU funded sister projects. I'm not sure about the experiences of you. I will be really keen to, um, to listen to this. Um, but it's it's just one other group of uh, stakeholders at the institutional level that that I think we need to pay pay attention to, and so I think that maybe my time is slowly running out, and I should be I should be uh, finishing. So it's I'm really looking forward to exchanging on on the various ways of engaging, uh, not only with policymakers but also with uh, NGOs and uh, uh, maybe businesses through gender dimension in research, which I think is one of the perfect avenues to do this because that's how people can come on board with things that are of interest because maybe they are not so concerned about the proportions of women in the institutional level, but the gender dimension is something that, that really speaks uh, to all of us. So thank you for having me here to open. Thank you, Marcela. And before I give the floor to Maria, I forgot to say something in the introduction is that Caliper is live tweeting at this event. So you can also follow Twitter uh, live. Uh, Maria, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Monique. Let me see if I managed to share my screen. Can you see it properly? I hope so, yeah. Uh, so um, thank you, uh, Marcela, for your, um, uh, for your words and for your initial reflections. Uh, uh, Caliper and its approach uh, was quite um, inspired by, by the work, um, part of the work that was uh, done under, under Gender Action, uh, for sure. So um, basically what we would like to uh, focus upon is uh, the fact that, okay, besides um, uh, introducing Caliper uh, and, and um, uh, the way we work with uh, um, seven RPOs uh, from Italy, Turkey, Greece, Croatia, Belgium, Spain, uh, and two RFOs uh, in Georgia and Romania, uh, I wanted to um, emphasize on, on um, the thinking behind uh, this uh, linking 
uh, the internal institutional change for gender equality in universities and research funding organizations with the um, external uh, actors uh, from uh, respective uh, innovation ecosystems. So basically, we started from two assumptions. One is that gender inequalities um, represent joint challenges for research institutions and all the actors in the uh, in the ecosystems um, and these challenges can uh, be acknowledged and be transformed into uh, joint actions possibly uh, in which ways i mean um, we can look at the innovation ecosystems from many angles the unbalanced representation of uh, women in stem studies in um, stem oriented um, startups and enterprises we can look at innovation processes, at the content of innovation, as Marcela was mentioning. Um, but it's really, uh, to put it simple, it's quite clear that if a university is challenging in uh, finding uh, female students to enroll uh, to their STEM courses, this um, difficulty is shared by high schools, possibly, at the local level. Uh, it starts at, at earlier stages um, and uh, it's definitely a joint uh, and shared challenge. At the same time, um, if universities want to integrate a, a gender plus and the sex dimension in the content and methods of scientific research, the same, similarly important, this is for uh, the industry uh, in, the, in the process of designing um, uh, products that meet the needs of um, all population and for uh, cities or social innovation actors if they have to create and co-create uh, services welfare services for example that um, that are fully inclusive so these are just a few examples and we, we um, basically uh, had the second assumption was that leveraging on a quadruple helix approach, um, expanding the definition of innovation ecosystems, including uh, women NGOs, um, social innovation actors, um, national level entities, even beyond what is normally considered uh, as a member of such ecosystem, and integrating a gender plus dimension into this vision would uh, allow uh, universities uh, and RFOs uh, to identify, identify possibly uh, possible joint actions uh, and even motivate internal stakeholders further uh, by presenting institutional change and gender equality plans as um, a more holistic type of challenge that amplify uh, the uh, outreach of the university. The way we proceeded was uh, integrating uh, this approach into uh, all main project phases. We conducted external assessments, not only internal assessments uh, at the partner institutions, so mapping and assessing the national regional ecosystems and the network of alliances that were there. Um, we uh, also, of course, uh, detected a series of gender gaps. And then we engaged um, with external stakeholders in the gender equality plans design phase. We created loose networks, informal networks of stakeholders named uh, Caliper Research and Innovation Apps. And uh, we then uh, engaged with each individual stakeholder uh, to bring them on board into the specific uh, gender equality plan measures that were um, then implemented. All in all, um, this engagement uh, approach was uh, quite successful so far. Uh, we have uh, 176 uh, organizations engaged um, in all countries. You can see here um, a, a summary of the, I mean, their, their contribution uh, to the uh, implementation of um, measures and actions in the JEPS. You see that most of them come from academia, the business sector, but also uh, national and regional organizations and 
civil society entities, uh, and particularly gender experts, organizations, and feminist NGOs. Uh, they are engaged in uh, different type of activities um, uh, through collaborative actions. Um, most of them um, uh, regard, refer to communication and institutional communication, but also um, the gender dimension in research is quite covered, as well as um, human resources measures that, that um, influence uh, and want to change uh, recruitment and career progression of um, academic staff. Um, all in all, the collaboration has been really positive and fruitful. Uh, we are monitoring and evaluating it. Uh, we can share more examples of um, specific actions that um, were um, put in practice. Um, I think that uh, I would leave the floor to um, Anna Mari uh, to this regard, and then we can um, maybe um, uh, present uh, more examples in the during the Q&A. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Maria. <clears throat> and indeed, yeah, if you can stop sharing, and then I give the floor to Anna Maria. So hello, everyone. Uh, today, I'm very happy to be in this panel uh, with my dear colleagues. And thank you all uh, participants uh, for coming to listen to our experiences. In fact, uh, I am a professor of mathematics, so my expertise is not in uh, gender equality. However, throughout my career working at the university and studying uh, at the Faculty of Mathematics and Science, uh, I experienced what we are uh, speaking about uh, in uh, many advantages and many disadvantages being a woman in, in a uh, mainly dominated uh, profession. Um, we were very, very happy to join Caliper project. And uh, when we were starting, uh, it was, uh, it started uh, in 2020. So before the European Commission uh, issued uh, um, eligibility criteria for all institutions to have a gender equality plan. So as far as pro Croatia, where my faculty is based, uh, at that point, the scenery was much different than it is in 2022. Nobody even knew what gender equality plan is, and uh, uh, we couldn't uh, refer to other uh, institutions, not even the ministry, for any help and guidance what is expected from us. So the Caliper project uh, uh, and Maria as a scientific coordinator, they were really, really important for us uh, to guide us, uh, to show us what is happening in the uh, European Union and in other institutions and the advice, guidance, uh, strategic leisure, leadership that we received was crucial for us uh, in order to implement uh, our gender equality plan in a strategic way, but also in the operational way. Uh, so Maria was speaking more about the strategy uh, of the Caliper projects, but operationally, what did we di do? So straight from the beginning, uh, the first step uh, in, in starting our JEP was actually the analysis uh, of the situation at the faculty, but also in Croatia. And we used already that moment uh, to, to reach out to our stakeholders in industry, in, in university, in schools, uh, ministries, uh, so to hear from them what they expe expect from us, because we also wanted to be, become a hub of ideas for other uh, institutions who, who will start these kind of processes. But we also try to listen to them uh, uh, and to ask them how they could help us uh, uh, implement the ideas that we want to help, that we want to do. Uh, so, uh, for example, uh, with the uh, other STEM faculties of the university, uh, we are working together how to make our STEM courses uh, uh, have gender dimension, because sometimes the professors who don't have uh, education in this area, who are mathematicians, electrical engineers, don't really know how to implement into course of linear algebra 
this dimension, how to uh, change yourself, your approach, uh, your notes uh, uh, to fit into this. So for example, uh, we did that uh, with the industry. Uh, they they were really helpful uh, with um, organizing uh, events for uh, uh, pupils from schools, uh, female girls uh, who we want to attract uh, to, to study at the Faculty of Electrical Engineering and Computing uh, in order to raise uh, our uh, female participation. Because now at the moment we have like a, a quarter of our students are uh, female and 15% um, of our professors are uh, female. So everybody was really collaborative. Uh, speaking about uh, the, the title uh, of our uh, of our webinar, what works and how do we convince our stakeholders? Uh, I think very important for us was, uh, it was during the COVID when we were doing all this analysis, but it was really important that when you invite a stakeholder to a dialogue, uh, that you listen to, to, uh, to them. So if they have some ideas what you could do together, you should make an effort uh, to, to really respect their ideas and to jointly uh, work uh, to, towards more gender equal uh, universities. And uh, so we, we always try to uh, co-create uh, co uh, all uh, our events. Uh, that way everybody became more interested and in trying to uh, participate. And uh, just the last thought, uh, and then uh, let's move to the next uh, panelist. Uh, it is the Caliper project was really, really important uh, for us to start this process because in Croatia we still don't have uh, the internal, uh, let's say, strategy uh, how to uh, implement operationally the European strategy in this area. So uh, I hope that uh, in the future, uh, Horizon Europe will also offer these kinds of projects uh, who will help with some fundings and also provide uh, uh, guidance to the countries uh, and universities how to operationally uh, uh, dedicate funding and human resources uh, uh, so that this uh, strategy does not remain only an empty uh, promise because one is strategy and the other is uh, implementation so that's all for me for now thank you for listening thank you very much Anna marie uh, and then i would like to give the floor to linda Good afternoon. I hope that you can hear me okay, everyone. Perfect. Uh, my name is Linda Gustafsson. Uh, I work as a gender equality officer for the city of Umeå, which is located in the north of Sweden. Uh, and I am, I think, maybe the odd one out in the panel today. I'm going to talk more about from a local administration perspective and how we work with gender equality. Um, and also the work that we've done in our project called Gendered Landscape. Um, Umeå is a city that has worked quite actively with gender equality for a long time. Uh, so has uh, experience, I would say, both in how to um, uh, strategically, uh, uh, how to uh, work with policies in, in regard to gender equality, but also how to uh, make them operational within different departments of a city, for example. Um, we have uh, politicians in Umeå that are responsible for the work with gender equality, and that has been in place since 1994, so quite a long time. Uh, someone working with gender equality strategically in the organization has also been in place since 1989 um, and we are in no way uh, done so it's a uh, it's a work that takes a long time and it's uh, always ongoing um, we have for the last three years also been the lead partner in a European action planning network called gendered landscape where we have worked with uh, together with five other European cities um, and uh, our method of work in Umeå 
uh, and what I hope is also valuable for the uh, participants today is uh, we try to focus on gender equality, something that needs to be holistically understood, but locally contextualized. So understanding gender inequality as a global issue, understanding how it affects women and how it affects men, but then also uh, contextualizing it to uh, for my like for me working in a city, what is what kind of city is Umeå? What kind of national legislation does Sweden have? Um, what kind of local goals do we have for the municipality? But also, uh, where do people live in our city? How do they travel? How much money do they have? What level of higher education is there? Uh, how is the gender la labor market segregated? Um, what do people do in their free time? Do women feel unsafe or safe in public spaces? And then out of that, sort of contextualization, that is what, what we mean when we talk about the gendered landscape, um, that we all live in a gendered landscape. And out of that context, seeing so what keys do we need to work with uh, in our specific context? And of course, that differs if we talk about different European cities. I would also say that differ differs from different organizations. What is it that we really need to focus on? What is sort of the biggest barrier for us or something that we need to start with? Uh, in relation to STEM and education, uh, I would say that one of the experiences that we have uh, in the city of Umeå is that um, when it comes to, for example, upper secondary school, we get girls that apply and girls that are in programs focusing on STEM. Uh, and uh, pardon my language maybe, but one experience that we have is that we also sort of hug them to death. We make them very special. Uh, we uh, offer them different... Uh, uh, they feel in dialogue with the girls who are involved in programs upper secondary school that is in relation to STEM, they sometimes feel like they are singled out, that they are very visible. They are already very visible because they are a minority, but then we're so keen on keeping them. So we give them different things, contacts with companies or internships that are very, very valuable, which also leads to them being even more exposed. And what they say that at least some of the girls that we've had dialogue with is what they say is we want to be just like everyone else. Like I'm here because I'm interested in this subject. I want to be like everyone else. So from a local administration standpoint, I would say that what we can do best is to make sure that the structure that surrounds education, for example, that that is a, an environment that is inclusive, that that is an environment where everyone feels like they're welcome and to create really the the structure surrounding uh, the, the education that is offered, but also then, also of course that also going into university and higher education. Uh, these are the same experience that we have in other departments of the city that are gender segregated with a minority of women, for example, within the fire department, fire, fire, with the firefighters. Um, one last thing that I wanted to mention was also, um, in our work with Gender Landscape Project, uh, the Action Planning Network, we worked with smart cities and highlighting how can a local authority or city make sure that we integrate an understanding of gendered power structures when new like innovative solutions to urban challenges are presented. For example, uh, what does it mean for women if we have an autonomous vehicles uh, whose body triggers smart street lights? Who who is inputting data into open data systems like what kind of bias are we building into new sort of innovative digital technical solutions uh, and lastly also in relation to innovation i just wanted to say that umu was selected as a runner-up for the european capital of innovation in 2018 Athens won that year we know we're a smaller city we cannot compete when it comes to number of incubators or something like that but what we brought to the table what Umu said, our innovation is the work with gender equality and the work with citizen participation. That's the innovation. And it at least led us to a runner-up position in the from the European Commission, just highlighting that um, we need to, that to work with structures and systems that make sure that your idea isn't dismissed based on who is walking into the room with the idea and what gender that person is perceived to have. That's the innovation. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Linda, also from this kind of different perspective, but very valuable. 
Um, so I would like to ask the participants to post their question in the Q&A. I see also questions coming in in the chat. I won't forget them, but it's just easier for me to, to find them in one place together rather than um, moving back and forth. Um, so I think um, what I would like to start with is the, the first question is, what is the biggest challenge to achieve a joined up approach between universities and other stakeholders? So how do you tackle this? Um, not sure. Who wants to say something on this first? Maybe Linda, can you follow this up? Because you've clearly done a lot uh, within the city between different stakeholders. Well, one thing that I, because I've, I've worked quite a lot in different, uh, um, with different researchers in collaboration. Uh, and uh, one of the things, and we've also, uh, one of the things that I think is uh, important, and this might be way too practical advice, I don't know, but uh, this is what came to mind, is that uh, I find it very, very valuable to when we when we go into some sort of collaboration to talk about like what is the goal of what we are doing in our organization, like. I work for local administration. That means that political goals are what I, I'm a civil servant. I work with the political goals set by the politicians in Umeå. Um, if I am a researcher at a university, my goal is maybe not the goals of that specific university. My goal might be, I would like to be a professor. <laughs> that it might be the goal. I, I, want, I need to do research that I can publish. That is what, like, why am I in this collaboration? And I'm not saying that, and by saying that, I don't mean, I don't want to sound like one is better or one is worse. It's just, uh, it's really good to have this understanding of the different sort of logics of the different organization, because otherwise it becomes like gravel in the machinery. But if we talk about it from the start, it really, or my experience is that that's really uh, valuable to do that and to understand each other. Yeah, so it's about communication and managing expectations maybe as well. Yeah. Uh, anyone else who wants to add to this? I think Marcella is, or not. Um, then maybe, maybe I follow I up with, oh, sorry. Yeah, maybe, yeah. Thank you, Monique. No, maybe um, I would just, uh, uh, emphasize a bit what what uh, uh, Linda was mentioning. It's it's really a lot about uh, aligning interests, um, and you know uh, both at the individual level and at the organizational level, and uh, and pick up you know the the goals and the priorities that are focused uh, as much as possible. Uh, and then that try to meet all the respective um, uh, interests interests that, that, that are there. But of course, there, there, the need, basic need, is to share a common agenda and a common understanding of um, gender equality as a as a transformative uh, um, type of of, of goal. Uh, so it, it, it's about setting up alliances and for this you need to be on the same page, you need to share uh, the goals and also to use possibly common indicators uh, to, to map and to track the change that you, that you are trying to, to pursue. Um, so that, that's important. Yeah, thanks Maria. Yeah, Marcella. Yeah, I just want to uh, follow up. I think that one uh, danger threat that we are seeing is the insistence on uh, academic autonomy, uh, uh, which is often used um, as a way to sort of sidestep the responsibilities. And so I think that it's it's really important to bring the um, universities, research institutions together with the national authorities uh, to also have discussions about this, because I think that in the countries where we have a more robust policy framework on the various issues, we then also see that things are moving uh, more rapidly forward. And of course, it's not 
perfect. But when you look at the countries that have a requirement for gender equality plan uh, or have uh, targets, for example, for uh, women on boards, we then also see that, you know, much more is happening. And the same is also true, for example, uh, on the topic of gender-based violence and sexual harassment. Uh, so, for example, in, in the UNICEF project, we are seeing that the countries that have the national frameworks for this, for universities, uh, then the institutions are forced to, uh, you know, take action to protect students and staff. And so I think that that setting the national frameworks uh, and uh, having discussions about how we can't uh, use or misuse uh, the argument of academic freedom and uh, autonomy as a way to um, sidestep responsibilities for creating equitable uh, research and academic uh, environments is really important. Yeah, thanks, Marcella. I, th I think that I'm just going to add some personal note. I mean, of course, we, we see that in a lot of places. And then when Cora, etc., I let go, then you immediately see numbers drop. But how, I mean, plans is one, forum is one, but how do you change the culture, especially in terms of harassment? I think it's a culture change what is needed. So how, how do you do that? Because I think everyone is struggling with that, to be honest. <laughs> I know, and I mean, with uh, we are now uh, nearing uh, the end of the Gender Smart Project, and um, my organization is doing the external monitoring and evaluation. And so we are just in the process of of doing that, and this is really something that all the institutions are grappling with because you may often manage to put things on paper, uh, you may have um, you know committed leadership, but then of course, how do you reach uh, the people to to uh, start change? But that's, I mean, that's why I think the stress that you have in Caliper on, on the stakeholder engagement uh, internally and externally is really crucial. And I would, I mean, from what I've seen in the EU funded sister projects or what I'm seeing in the Czech Republic, also supporting organizations um, to, to promote institutional change. This is really the most important thing in a way that needs to be built into um, the activities from the start to, to really gradually in, you know, enlarge um, the group of the stakeholders that are willing to speak up, uh, that have your back, uh, that may not necessarily attend all the training uh, events that you have, et cetera, but you need them to, to support uh, the, the motion as such. And I would say, also, based on what we've seen at the conference uh, on uh, gender-based uh, violence, engage with student organizations and early career researchers because, I mean, they are, they are some of the most vulnerable in the system uh, financially, but also otherwise, and these people have stakes, uh, they, they will be sometimes willing to speak up and they should definitely be engaged in the change process. So I would I would really speak up for yeah student yeah. organizations, early career researchers. So I'm I'm gonna continue because questions now come in, of course. Now we start discussing. So what do you think are the biggest challenges faced by female STEM researchers and how would you address them? And I think that's to all maybe, but um... And then it's remaining silent. I think that uh, Anna Mari might, uh, might. Yeah, that's what I wanted to the say. The more you know, hands-on experience on 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 this. Uh, well, um, indeed, what we see from uh, the the research that we did precisely at the faculties for for our employees, uh, the 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 period in uh, in the female careers when they are trying to start a family is a, a very sensitive period because it is usually at the beginning of your career you're getting the first permanent position and uh, uh, you should prove yourself immediately there is a big pressure to get as much projects uh, as possible to publish uh, the best papers in mathematics they say that after 40 you are not usable uh, anymore uh, to write new theorems but at the same time biology is that uh, you want to start a family this is uh, this is 
for our researchers and the culture in Croatia, this is the, the same period. So the, there immediately look at looking at numbers, you can see the difference between our male uh, researchers and female researchers. Uh, in a sense uh, that women stay longer in the uh, um, this this first step of uh, uh, being assistant professor, so it goes slow with all the maternity leaves. It goes uh, more slowly to uh, to rise uh, to go to the next step, associate professor. Then you can see that uh, our male colleagues actually have more children than uh, female colleagues. Uh, you can you can see that, and nothing happens to their uh, careers. And uh, so, so that is like, uh, and then slowly, little by little, whatever project you apply, uh, they always take uh, the the CV and uh, and just look at it numerically, how many papers, how many projects, uh, what you did, and of course, if you took some time to to start a family, uh, then your low numbers are lower, and uh, and immediately it 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 piles up uh, in the next 30 years uh, of your career. So I would say yeah. this is not very original answer from me that you are receiving. I think uh, uh, European Commission and all the countries, everybody is well aware of this. But so this is the first problem I think that uh, we yeah. want to solve and we are still on that obvious problem uh, not, not being uh, solved. But I would also like to say that uh, even uh, even if maybe for women who are not in that uh, point uh, in life, starting a family, there is also a stereotype not to burden you too much or not to expect too much from you because sooner or later you will focus on the family and not on the career. So it is better to invest into a male colleague on whom you can count on. So there is also... A stereotype uh, what is expected of a female researcher how to lead your life uh, uh, and so how much you can interact and contribute to the community yeah so that comes back to the bias and the cultural change which is needed uh, and i think that what you say about the the, the um, getting children face let's say I would hope this would also be part of this whole research assessment reform, which is now happening in the EU, but that would be a full <laughs> new webinar if we go there. So let's not go there uh, at the moment because there's still quite a few uh, questions there. Um, so maybe uh, since we talk specifically about women and what their, their bottleneck is, I'll go to uh, a question. So are there also projects and funds aiming at attracting men? in humanities and cultural as well as social services and care service careers. Is there anyone who can say something about this? Well, I don't know if there are projects, but uh, uh, recently we, uh, while we were trying to uh, write uh, a text for our colleagues, how to uh, put more uh, gender awareness into your STEM courses, we found out that in Germany, they have a, a, a career day for the girls where they are trying to attract them to female professions. And there is also a, a boys day where they are trying to uh, present them and attract them more to female professions oh no before it was male professions now female professions okay. so i yeah. don't know about the project but germany is doing this on a on a national level no other uh, yeah i can I just you... i can just add on to that from just a local perspective also that absolutely um it's it's about, I mean, now Sweden is also a country with a very gender segregated labor market uh, and that it's all absolutely about sort of breaking barriers in different ways. So uh, uh, male preschool teachers, for example, uh, working in like working in different types of social care uh, or care as a whole. Uh, absolutely, there are initiatives, uh, both at least those I, I am aware of national level and local level. Uh, one should, should though remember that uh, 
uh, traditional male uh, occupations pay much more than traditional female occupations. So, you know, you're also moving different ways on the ladder and uh, it's not, yeah. So there are different aspects of it, but I think that's also important to remember. Yeah, definitely. Um, so there's someone who's asking how the Kalipa project relates to uh, existing. I mean, we've mentioned quite a few other projects already, but uh, how Kalipa relates to any of the existing quality frameworks we use in the UK, like the Institute of Physics UNO project or the Athena SWOM process for universities. So is there a link with Calippa or not, uh, or how? Not directly, I, I would say. Um, well, um, the uh, UNO and Athena Swan are not um, applicable to, to the, to the Calippa partners. We don't have uh, uh, partners from UK uh, or um, Ireland. Um, but uh, of course, we um, so we try to connect the gender equality plans as much as we can with um, the existing, um, let's say, awarding process that many of the partners are undergoing. That it's the HR strategy for researchers. Um, for the, we had several partners who um, have uh, either. Uh, managed to incorporate gender equality elements into their existing uh, HR strategies for researchers' um, action plans, uh, or uh, other partners who are um, uh, advocating towards their uh, uh, leadership um, for um, undergoing uh, the HR strategy for researchers process. Um, I wanted to go back uh, to the um, to the to what uh, Linda was mentioning, um, considering uh, the the, the um, uh, thread of our conversation on how universities collaborate with uh, with um, uh, local entities and and even cities. Um, I wanted just to uh, to mention that uh, I was really. Um, uh, positively um, struck by the um, uh, by by your experience um, when we when I recently participated to uh, to the to the stud, to a study visit in Umea. Um, maybe I mean considering this that Sweden uh, has quite a peculiar uh, and advanced sort of uh, framework in terms of gender equality. Um, one could not maybe notice, but for me, it was really uh, striking the way that for planning um, uh, gender inclusive and inclusive urban spaces in Umea, and also for um, uh, designing the uh, inclusive smart city solutions that you put in place, uh, you relied on a lot of knowledge that was produced from the from the local universities uh, and that was uh, conducted with a gender um, dimension explicitly incorporated into 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 the studies so that I think was was really really uh, visible to me and valuable uh, thanks Maria um, yeah I just want to add I see a comment in the chat so uh, Cardiff University is, of course, part of Calipper, but not as a stakeholder. The university itself is a stakeholder, but a slightly different role, uh, the Academia Europea, together with the Young Academy of Europe in this. Um, so maybe coming back to challenges of STEM women. So there is a comment in the chat that, or in the Q&A, that caring responsibility for aging parents also tends to impact more on female um, uh, researchers uh, compared to men and I think the next question relates to that so is this taken into account in gender equality plans and programs do people know if this is specifically I, I don't know to be honest Marcella yeah so I, I think that we are all aware of the issue but I uh, honestly do not think that I have seen it included in a gender equality plan with concrete actions 
Uh, mm -hmm. The focus is predominantly on the, you know, early career stage. I have to really second what Anna Marie uh, said before. I mean, in the Czech Republic, we are, you know, we have very similar situation, and our research shows that um, if there is an issue that is recognized by the institutional leadership, predominantly male, it is the fact that we need to create conditions for our female researchers to have babies and continue somehow careers, which then is compounded by the gender bias, which prevents women from progressing up to the higher career stages. So uh, I think that our experience he here is very, very similar. And uh, I, I hope that uh, the JEP eligibility requirement will start changing this, but on the attitudinal level, uh, it, it is very conservative here as well. Yeah, definitely. Uh, there's there's one more question in the Q&A. So people, if you have more questions, we have a little bit of time left. So if there are other questions, but there's a question um, from Wendy uh, again. And I think this is mostly also a reaction to what Anna-Marie uh, uh, said. So I would also love to hear some specific ideas on how you get lecturers in maths and electrical engineering to consider gender as something they need to think about when teaching. Well, first of all, I hope that you cannot hear the noise that I have behind me because they are drilling something excellent. Uh, I just wanted okay. to be, sh be sure that it is okay. Uh, well, uh, we, uh, in the first year, uh, last year, uh, uh, we developed uh, um, uh, like a guidelines and an unofficial tool uh, using the... the uh, the documents uh, uh, which we were able to find uh, concerning uh, inserting gender equality and gender dimension into courses and uh, curricula. And um, we started having uh, workshops uh, where professors could can come with their own uh, course, uh, lecture notes, uh, uh, and see what uh, what how can they change their course uh, while it still remains a STEM course. So for some topics, it's easier if you are really have something from electrical engineering, uh, robotics, uh, something that uh, applies uh, uh, to the world, or you are doing something uh, uh, developing. Uh, gadgets for uh, medicine, uh, uh, then it is even obligatory to uh, conduct your research both for men and women, but also different ages uh, and other things. But for example, I'm professor of mathematics and I teach uh, discrete mathematics, which is like definition. I don't know if you all had uh, mathematics at the university level, but uh, so it is like a definition, theorem, definition, theorem, and the, the structure that is taught uh, in, in, math in discrete mathematics is a graph. It is very, very abstract level. So I was thinking, what could I do for my course? Okay, I am a woman, so that is uh, the, the gender dimension <laughs> also in my course. So students can see a woman teaching them uh, mathematics. Uh, who is also a researcher, so that is a, a, another plus for me. I don't know how my male colleagues uh, <laughs> will do, but for example, one of the topics in discrete mathematics is graph coloring, and uh, it is very applicable. I don't want to go into details, but uh, in 2014, uh, 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 Miriam Mizarkani was the first woman to receive a Fields Medal, which is like a Nobel Prize uh, for mathematicians. She was the first female, and uh, she was uh, her research and the award for was for the hyperbolic surface, uh, surfaces, which has nothing to do with discrete mathematics. But uh, I found out looking through her CV that her first paper when she was a, a brilliant undergraduate student was about graph coloring. And I managed to find this paper. And, uh, and uh, so when I'm speaking about graph coloring, I, I speak also about Miriam Mizarkani and uh, she is being the first woman and what she wrote in that paper. So I really, I think that was my way how to uh, insert uh, this topic and, and, uh, and show the missing part of uh, uh, presenting female contribution to the development uh, uh, of various uh, 
topics uh, to my students. So let's see, in the end of the course, we will have a, uh, a survey to see if they noticed anything. <laughs> Yeah, and then the next step would be to have male colleagues do similar things, of course. Um, in view of the time, and there is one final question, which I think is a very nice question from Luis to end the webinar uh, with. And that's to all of you. So how should an inclusive uh, research and innovation landscape look like in five to 10 years? So maybe I start, I, I go the order of the webinar. So maybe I start with Marcella. <laughs> it's not an easy question to answer. Not an easy one. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think that we won't be able to reach some gender equal paradise. And what we're also seeing in Europe is that it, it works as a pendulum. So, I mean, when we look at Sweden now and where Sweden was, I don't know, 15 years ago, where Spain is now and Ireland and where they are now, you know, it's it's going to move. So what I think is important is that we keep the issue on the agenda as a priority so that the countries and the institutions that are in less favorable uh, environment can draw on the support from the countries where the issue has priority. I think that this has worked really very well for the past, I don't know, 10 years. And uh, I, I think that this sort of support internationally is really crucial. We're seeing it with Poland, we're seeing it with Hungary, we're seeing it with uh, Slovakia. Hopefully there won't be too many countries joining uh, joining this list. And then what, what I really hope is that uh, I think we're seeing uh, changes among the younger generation. Uh, it's not all saving, but, uh, but I think the changes are there. There's more awareness, there's mo more openness. I think that issues of LGBTQI+, hopefully, will not be such a huge issue. I also think that uh, there is more recognition of uh, gender-based violence, sexual harassment. So there's insistence on, you know, this being addressed. Um, so I'm hopeful on, on these fronts, but uh, seeing how slow the change is in the top echelons, uh, I, I think that the battle will need to continue. Yeah, five to 10 years might not be enough. Yeah, Maria, you want to add anything? Totally agree uh, with Marcella. Um, I think we are really facing uh, backlashes on, on several, at several levels. Um, uh, indeed, there is a gender fatigue, there is resistance to gender equality, there is a widespread um, uh, anti-gender discourses and, and politics and mobilization. Um, it's, it's really important that, um, it's even more important that an inclusive and even intersectional approach is fostered as Marcella was anticipated. So if we manage to connect uh, the, uh, you know, um, the change to achieve uh, equality between men and women to the other uh, inequality grounds uh, is, is, I mean, I think that the, the agenda will be strengthened, even if maybe it will receive uh, even more uh, fierce resistances from, from certain actors. But um, I think this is really important to overcome the, uh, the tendency to isolate gender equality policies, to uh, seclude them into sort of policy ghettos and and to connect them much more strongly with the other big issues that that our societies are facing to climate change uh, to you know peace war issues um, this i think would be um, really important thank you maria uh, anna marie so uh, from the beginning, I was speaking about my uh, more about my local and operational uh, world here at my faculty. So what I expect uh, in the next five or 10 years is 
that in every decision that uh, is being made that affects researchers and other employees, it is also asked a question, how does it influence men, women, uh, minorities of any kind? So that, uh, that, that would be a really gender dimension in all processes uh, at my faculty. And so, uh, and, and that would bring, to think more about equal opportunities. Uh, uh, what does this decision, uh, uh, adding certain rights or removing them to the employees, what does it mean for women? What does it mean for men? Does it uh, help their careers or block their careers? Uh, so not only the eight men who are deciding in the committee thinking for us it's okay, just think about the other ones who are not represented uh, in that room. Th that is what I expect on my local level. Yeah, and it's nice that you say expect and not hope or wish. <laughs> Linda. Um, well, as I also think it's a difficult question to answer, I agree also with previous speakers, it is a pendulum, it's, go it's going um, back and forth uh, with, uh, when it comes to gender equality or gender inequality, but uh, I just think that I can uh, see that at least what we've learned is the only way to sort of get moving forward. You need to be, yeah, you need to be brave. And if you have the possibility to raise your voice, if you're not living in a country or a city, an organization where you feel like it's dangerous for you to speak up, then you need to speak up and you need to use words that pinpoint, you know, we say, we need to talk about power. We need to talk about like, like really putting words into it. What is it that needs to be changed? And then I think just collaboration, collaboration, sharing ideas, sharing knowledge, supporting each other, uh, just finding those networks I can see moving forward. And, and I can see that those that's the way to try to build some sort of momentum. I think that's a very nice ending uh, to this webinar, actually. Joint action is, is, is key here. Um, thank you all very much for your contributions. It, I think it was very variable and very nice. Uh, the recording of this webinar will be published in well a few days or a week's time on the Academia Europea YouTube channel. Um, so if you follow Caliper tweets, etc., I'm sure the link will be posted there. Thanks again very much for your to the panelists for your participation, but also for the participants for asking questions. And hopefully we see each other again soon in some kind of uh, way. Thanks very much.